Hi, everyone. This is Will O'Toole again for Park Ridge Sports History. I didn't realize this coming into the show. It's number episode 150. And with that, we have an exciting show because we've taken it basically outside. And we're going to be talking about the White Chapel Windmill, the boxing career of Jack Kid Berg. And I hope you join us because it's an exciting career, just not just in the ring, but outside it as well. And of course, I have with me the expert on Jack Berg and relative of the great boxer, Howard Fredericks. Howard, obviously, welcome to our show. And uh, this is a real treat because this is the first time that I've been able to work with you. And what better thing than Jack Kid Berg? Have to be honest, when you presented the article to me or the show, had no, I'm not a big boxing fan. I'm usually, you're, you're basically your meat and potatoes, hockey, basketball, college sports, baseball, and basketball. This, I love the opportunity just because, like I always say on Park Ridge Sports History, gives me an opportunity to dive further into the world of sports. So thank you. And as I continue to talk, just take it away. Um, tell me why and how you became interested in Jack Kidberg. Obviously a relative, but there's gotta be more to it than that. Yes, so when I was a kid, I was probably hmm, maybe 10, 11, 12 years old in that age range. Um, my dad gave me a book called The Jew in American Sports by Harold Ribolo. And of course, that book was a fantastic book because it had all sorts of interesting chapters on various Jewish historical sports figures. Uh, Sid Luckman, the football player, Hank Greenberg, the baseball player, and lo and behold, there was a whole chapter on my cousin, Jack Kid Berg. So, and there was this fantastic photo of him. Um, and what was really, you know, really inspiring for me is that Jack actually, although we're not related by blood, he somehow still looked remarkably like my father. Um, in his appearance and in his hairstyle uh, from his boxing photos. So I was just really taken by that um, appearance. And then probably again of when I was about 12 or 13, my dad used to take me to Jack's older brother's house, Willie, Willie Berg, um, who lived in Brooklyn at the time. And Willie was Jack's corner man for his American fights. So I got to meet Willie and hear a, more about my cousin Jack from Willie, although Jack was at the time living in London, so I never actually had the opportunity to meet him when I was a kid growing up. But I felt almost like I met him because I met his older brother, Willie. And that's a great segue because what interested me the most in this book is that he's not technically American, and technically he's not even of English roots per se. But when I was reading the book, and talking to you uh, a couple of weeks ago, he's actually an immigrant to England. And maybe you can fill us in because <laughs> there was a show I was watching prior to coming onto this show, and it was uh, The Best of Life, and an English show. It was uh, a show about, let's say, biographies of people. And in it, they claim he was parents of Russian Jews. When I was talking to you, though, you said it might not be Russian Jews as much as Ukrainian or Polish. So I thought That's maybe right. you could fill us in a little bit. Right. Well, that. so just a bit of history. Certainly there was a large part of the Russian Empire at the time, and that shifted over, over time, around the turn of the 20th century, that encompassed a number of countries that we know today as being, for example, Poland. Parts of Poland were considered to be Russia Poland. They were part of the Russian Empire. So for example, my grandparents, my grandfather, my father's father, came from a little town about 90 miles south of Warsaw, but it was considered part of the Russian Empire at the time, even though today it's part of Poland. So on his um, immigration documents, it says that he was from Russia. Okay. So um, likewise, the Ukraine, parts of the Ukraine were also part of the Russian Empire, and they were also part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So there are some people who were born in what is now today Poland, whose documents indicate Austria. So for example, that was the case with my father's mother. She was listed as being from Austria, even though she may have actually have been from what is now today Ukraine. We believe that she was from near Koso or Kosiv, 
um, which is part of Ukraine now, but at the time was part of the Austro-Hungarian mm -hmm. Empire. So there's a lot of kind of overlap as to what is considered to be Russia, what is considered to be Poland, what is considered to be Ukraine at various points in history. And there is some controversy in my family about um, where Jack's family was from. There's some discussion about they may have been from near Odessa, which is distinctly in what is now Ukraine, but was part of the Russian Empire at the time. Um, but there's also some discussion uh, that perhaps they were actually from Poland. And what's interesting is that um, my great grandfather's brother was married to a woman named Ruta Bergman. Um, and she, I believe, was Jack's aunt or great aunt. And she was from a little town called Slupianova, Poland, which is where my grandfather and great grandfather were from, and uh, where her husband, my great grandfather's brother, uh, Joseph or Josula Fruchtman, was from um, Slupianova, Poland. So Ruta Bergman is definitively from Slupianova, Poland. So it makes sense that at least part of Jack's family, most likely on his father's side, would have been from somewhere in Poland. And the information that I garnered from various relatives of mine, including Willie, if I remember correctly, was that they were actually from Poland. It may have been the case that Jack's mother might have come from Odessa. Uh, so it's a little bit confusing. And, you know, as unfortunately most of these people are gone now, mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard to trace back. I did have a chance in relatively recent years to um, get to know Jack's youngest sister, Mari, who was born in 1920, 11 years after Jack was born. So she was still living when I was living in London between 2000 to in about 2010, and I had a chance to chat with her about some things, but even her information was somewhat limited because, um, you know, her parents were older by the time she became an adult, and, you know, people's memories start to fade and so forth, so mm -hmm. she wasn't really sure exactly where her parents were from. But one thing is definite with um, Jack Kidberg. He does have the nickname Whitechapel Windmill, does come from a poor background, yes. typical of boxers, it seems, that Many are from poverty, work their way up uh, and get out of poverty through boxing. And really, it's true with uh, Berg as well. Absolutely. But as your book, as the book that you gave me, can I hold this up? Yes, absolutely. Can I hold this up? All right. I know I have all my little notes and all the rest of it in there. Uh, there's a great cartoon on the back. But um, he was, one, not ashamed, and actually, two, promoted his Jewish faith, even though he was not one of the most, quote-unquote, religious Correct. growing up. I, I found a picture of him. And, of course, you see the Star of David. And, uh, well, I'm going to let you go from there because he does probably use it as a marketing tool, but I also exactly. do believe that was a matter of pride because, you know, boxing has been rich with ethnicity, of probably of all the sports. You have your Irish boxers, you have your black boxers, you have your Spanish boxers, you have your Jewish boxers, your German, all the rest of it. And as I stated, it seems to be the one sport that many gravitate to to get out of extreme poverty. Absolutely. Illuminate us on Berg's yes. Uh, yep. boyhood. Yes. So Jack was born on Cable Street in London's East End, which is a very poor Jewish immigrant neighborhood. Um, he lived in what we would describe here in the United States as being a tenement. He was born above a fish and chip shop <laughs> uh, on Cable Street. And then I think eventually lived on a street called Romford Street. Um, but uh, yes, he came from quite a poor background. Um, his father was a tailor. And in fact, his father wanted him to become a cabinet maker, as would be, you know, quite common. The Jewish fathers and wanted their children to become um, something, you know, a good trade that they right. could earn a good living in and support the family. A modest, but good, comfortable trade. And um, Jack tried a little bit of it, but he, he wasn't really having it. <laughs> it wasn't his thing. And, you know, he was a bit of a street fighter. He got into a lot of street fights. Um, and um, he would sometimes earn a few bucks that way or a few pounds that way, a quid, um, 
that way from, um, from street fighting. And in fact, one of the ways that he was discovered in his early fighting career was that he wanted to fight at Premier Land, which was the leading boxing venue in London's East End in the early 1920s and before. Um, and he, you know, they, they kept saying to him, you know, you're too young, kid. You know, he was probably about 14 at the time, uh, 13, 14, you know, young, young kid. And um, the, the trainer at the ring there at Premier Laren did not want to let him fight. He's not, you're too young, you know. So he spent his time kind of hanging out outside of the, uh, the venue there. And he was helping, you know, watch people's cars. They would come drive up to the place and he would keep an eye on the car while they were inside at Premier Land. And one day a fellow came over and was trying to sit on the hood of one of the cars that he was protecting. And Jack said, no, no, get off that car there. And the guy, you know, basically said, make me. And, um, you know, just, oh, you better, better do that. And the guy, like, spat on the car, actually. And Jack wow. saw red, and he beat the tar out of that guy. <laughs> and people came and saw him, including the trainers at Premier Lair, and that was it. That launched Jack's professional boxing career, because after that, the people at Premier Land said, you know, this kid can really fight. He's not too young. He's a little guy at this point. He's still a kid, but we can make some money off of him. Let's let him fight professionally. So he had his first professional fight in 1923 at the age of 14. Although if you look at his record, it doesn't show that as being his first professional fight. It's actually, um, you know, starts a little bit later than that. <laughs> it's just when they actually <laughs> officially recorded it. Um, but that's, that's kind of th that aspect of it. So yeah, so um, that's kind of how, how Jack began his, his and life. It, and, and it's interesting because technically, and I'm just using my little stats that I love to research, his first recorded professional fight was over uh, Gordon. I think it was Joe Gordon. Mm -hmm. And actually, he won his first 18 fights. And I just want to draw back to this. Um, Jack Berg was not a big guy, what you were saying. He, he fought in the welter and um, uh, lightweight, which is about 130. And I don't know all the classifications, so if you're a big boxing guy, don't get on me if I miss you by a few ounces or pounds or whatever. But basically, he's in the realm of 130 to maybe tops 150 for his entire career. Mm -hmm. and, and when I was going over his rep, it's real, 61 knockouts, 157 wins. <laughs> And only 26 losses with nine ties or draws. Correct. 192 and, fights altogether. And that's unbelievable. Officially. But, right. And so he's not getting any support from dad or his rabbi. In fact, if he shows up uh, for worship at all. And he becomes really uh, a product of the street. And that's not a, a knock. It's just... Uh, what it was. Yes. Well, so going back to the story about uh, the street, there were a lot of Orthodox Jews living in the London's East End at the time. And Jack was, uh, you know, didn't like to see them get abused by anti-Semitic people in the area. So there were certain, uh, you know, anti-Semitic gangs in the area, you know, of different ethnicities who would come and bother the more obviously Jewish Orthodox Jews who were wearing traditional outfits. And, um, you know, so they would come and harass these, these people, and Jack would come to their defense and, and beat them up and, and drive them away. So that's a lot of how he got his, his start um, with, with his fighting in the street. And, and turning to his boxing, there was two things I did want to ask you about. Um, one was obviously the star of David. I don't know whether he carried that throughout his career on his boxing thing, but he also wore something going into the ring. And mind you this, I don't want to forget this. He won his first 18 fights. Now, I don't know, I'm not an expert in boxing. It's pretty remarkable. He wins his first 18, and he's basically doing it every two to three weeks. That's and right. Like, elaborate <laughs> how we're right. taking well, from so there. So just in terms of the, mm -hmm. you mentioned the, the uh, attire that he was wearing in the ring. So he wore boxing trunks with a Star of David on them, and he would sometimes appear in the ring with a prayer shawl called a uh, talus. Okay, um, that's what I was thinking. I right, so that's one of the it. things that he wore. But his view on this, well, there were several aspects of it. You're correct. There's a certain marketing aspect to this, is that there were crowds of Jewish fight fans who would come to support a Jewish boxer against, let's say, an Irish boxer or Italian boxer or some other kind of ethnicity. Who would wear a shamrock or maybe yeah, the perhaps, flag of, uh, of Italy or whatever. Or, so it's or no, a British no Union Jack, for right, that matter. Right, exactly. Um, and so that was, that was part of it. Um, 
And it was also true both in England and in the United States when he fought. There were certainly these ethnic crowds. Um, so there was that aspect. But he was also a very superstitious guy. Although he was not religious, he believed in certain kinds of rituals of things that he would and wouldn't do before fights. And part of this was kind of like he would wear some of these outfits, not because he was religious, but as he kind of put it, like it can't hurt to, <laughs> to be, you know, to do these kinds of things and to, to take on these sorts of symbols, it, you never know. Right. Because he was a bit, in, in that sense, he was somewhat agnostic in nature, but I, I don't know that he was particularly... Totally agnostic. Totally agnostic, <laughs> right, exactly. If I can right. say it that way. Right. Well, I, so, I just, I, I just want to, um, and I didn't mean to interrupt if you're going to add, hmm? uh, I, and I pardon, pardon me if I do interrupt, he's just um, an interesting guy. But I'm just going down the list of guys that he fought Gordon, Harwood, Lyons, Clark, Pullen, Hicks, Clancy, uh, Wooden, Miller, Patton, or Peyton, Shepard, uh, Saunders, Lloyd, uh, Colburn, Colcomb, Streps, or Streets, pardon me, and Carter, and then Davis. He won in a DQ. I, I mean, and I'm my check marks here, if anybody's following home, he had of his first 18 fights, he must have had some powerful punch. Uh, hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Tw he had twelve knockouts in his first eighteen. Right. Uh, it's That's incredible. A pretty, pretty good, pretty good record when it comes to. He must to have had some punch. Actually, what's interesting about his boxing style uh, was that he wasn't known as being an extremely heavy, hard puncher. But what made him successful, including? achieving these knockouts was he was absolutely relentless in his style of fighting. He would come at people and just, oh, that was, you know, why he was known as either the Whitechapel windmill or the Whitechapel whirlwind, as he was known in the United States, because his boxing style is he would come at you like a windmill from all different angles, very fast, alternating left, right, left, right, left, right. His arms were like pistons. He would just come at you nonstop head down as opposed to standing flat-footed or dancing around he would just come right in charging in head down and he would pound away at the body and from all different angles and he would wear the opponents down so you know he, he when a lot of opponents would try to get away from him and lean back and stand back and hang out on the ropes and he loved it when they did that because he would just come charging right in at them and just wear them out. And that's how he got all of these knockouts, actually. And Howard, I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, I am on this because of the fights that he did lose, many of them, he went the distance or was disqualified for either a low blow or he would win late in the fight because uh, of low blows uh, on him. But th I... I I would say that just reading about him, he was had a relentless style, almost like That's right. almost like you wind him up That's and it's right. not over as long as you can wind him up and, and take him out. Because Howard, I, I, I was looking at this. Do you realize that he won over eighty-two percent of his fights? Mm. No, pardon me, eighty-five percent of his fights. His opponents had a collective winning record of 82 percent and if you exclude the fights against him it was 77 percent now i know a lot of people wow okay but the fighters he was they weren't tomato cans that they right. say in the rings and uh, all from different backgrounds all from different I, I think he probably beat everybody on every continent that was actually box tell me about uh the cuban boxer that he yes. fought he Go fought ahead. he fought kid chocolate um who was one of the the, the most important featherweight and lightweight boxers in history. Uh, he, Kid Chocolate was known as the Cuban Bonbon. Um, and uh, he also grew up in, in poverty and you know, used to watch fight films um, on, a, on a sheet that was put up on, in a street there um, in Havana. And he fought his way out of that poverty to become a, a, a top level, contending level fighter. Um, and Jack fought him twice and beat him twice, fought him at the Polo Grounds um, in 1930 at a time when my, my dad actually attended the fight with Kid Choc against Kid Chocolate, Kid Chocolate in 1930 with my grandfather. <laughs>
here I am after winning my fight with Kid Chocolate. It is needless for me to say how overjoyed I am for beating such a cagey box as Chocolate. My greatest ambition is now to bring to England the lightweight championship of the world. And however, I want to thank the American public for the way they have treated me here in this country. Now I will introduce to you my manager, Frankie Jacobs, and my two trainers, Whitey Bimstein and Ray Arcel. Not forgetting my closest associates, I thank you. Cheerio. And Howard, you know, he fought actually quite a few battles, not just in the New York area. He, he had a fight, and I had this down. He fought in Garfield. Yes. I, I can't remember Garfield, who he fought, and I had it here. I don't here, know off the top of But he fought in Garfield. He fought in Dreamland, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, fought in the Garden. Yes, Madison Square fact. Garden, Polo Grounds, Ebbets Field, um, a number of important top, you know, New York area venues, venues. boxing venues. Absolutely. Now, I, I will tell you this, and I don't know why I didn't list this, how dumb of me, but he was the champ how many times and in two different divisions. Right. If, so if I, I can he recall. was he was um, a junior welterweight world champion. OK, so that was his world championship level. He was also British lightweight champion. Okay. So those are his, his official championships. There's a little bit of controversy about the junior welterweight category. Some um, jurisdictions didn't actually recognize it as a separate and independent weight class, separate and uh, distinct from either lightweight or welterweight. Right. But, uh, the, you know, in the important areas, um, it was recognized. It was a, not something that was kept as a division for, for many years, and it sort of became out of favor eventually in, I think, in the late 1930s or early 40s. They sort of dropped the, the junior welterweight title. But in any case, he was definitely world junior welterweight title. And he actually won a fight against Mushy Callahan in 1930 at the Royal Albert Hall, in which he <laughs> became world junior welterweight champion. He defended that title seven times in 1930 and in another couple of times. So I think he defended that title a total of nine times, times. successfully, um, which is quite a few it, title defenses. It um, is, especially when you're fighting almost like every two weeks, which makes it even, people don't right. realize this, it, it makes it even more difficult because you're asking a guy to go out there two weeks after he's been beaten to a pulp, even if he wins, because I don't know how they do it, but two weeks afterwards, for the most part, and then get up again against a brand new opponent was, I don't even think I went through this and as I'm looking at it. And there's only one instance that I, I see offhand and I even recommend where he fought uh, the same boxer in back-to-back -back matches. And that was Zangrillo, uh, Z-A-N-G-R-I-L-L-O. He fought him in, in his match number 146, which he won, and then 147, which he also won. He beat him twice. And I'm stopping right here because people don't realize this. You, you see the football coaches constantly game planning. Well, imagine if you're a boxer. You have to game plan. Obviously, 157, 26, you're talking about 1,383. Basically, almost 200 fights. You had to have different game plans for every one of those guys. That's right. And here he is game planning against the guys. Maybe the Zeringo was, was good for him, but... You know, you're coming back and you say, all right, this is what I did right, this is what I did wrong. And generally, with what we've seen with boxing, there's always a rubber match because one win one, one the next one, and then there's sure. a rubber match. Sure. I, I go into this uh, about just the strategy yeah. and just well, the, the mental. Yeah. Well, he had some great trainers. His, perhaps his most famous trainer was Ray Arcel. Ray Arcel was known for having trained tremendous number of boxers, including, you know, even as more recently uh, such fighters as Roberto Duran. Uh, so he was around for a long time. Uh, Ray Arcel was born in 1900 and lived to about the age of 90-something. Um, so he trained Jack through a large part of his career, and that's part of the reason why he had such success. Was, uh, but Ray, Ray was also a, a, a great friend of his and almost a father-like figure to him and really helped to guide Jack a lot in his he was, Jack was a kind of a wild sort of guy. He wasn't a super kind of intellectual boxer, if you will, um, but he was just a, you know, wild brute force sort of 
go at it type of guy. <laughs> just and wind him up. You just go, and there's <laughs> fairly similar strategies that I think he employed in, in most of his fights. I don't think he was necessarily tailoring his approach that greatly. He had kind of like a thing that he did. Right. And he was a good looking guy. Yes, uh, he was. And, and actually, how do I say this? For a boxer, he kept his good looks. Yes. I, I mean, uh, as uh, this book mm -hmm. tells you, he's the oldest boxing champ to ever live, passed away in 1991. And you can just see how he starts out young, uh, obviously good looking, really basically kept his good looks. To me, that means not only did he know how to give a punch in that rapid file, but he also knew how to avoid a punch because Absolutely. with only, uh, only nine law would I have 26 losses. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there was only like three or four knockouts that he sustained. Yep. He was up on his feet for all those. Just incredible. So I think a lot of what he was able to do was really to take a punch. I mean, he, you know, he took a lot of punches. Right. He took a lot of punishment, but he was so relentless and his fighting spirit was so strong that he didn't just fall down. He didn't just give up. And even if he did get knocked down, he got right back up and continued his fights. And that's why he ended up wearing his opponents out is because he just didn't go down. He would go down, but come right back up and he wouldn't stay down. And he would just keep on fighting and fighting. And actually, there's a sort of technical aspect to this. It's interesting, you know, if you get hit in the face, it doesn't really hurt you that much. You just get knocked to the floor. You suddenly, you know, hit the floor, hit the canvas, and you can get right back up again. It's the body punches that you get that are the most painful and the most damaging. And he delivered a lot of body punches. That was part of what he did, because he had his head down, and he was going right in at the body for his opponents, and that wore them down. Kind of reminds me, and this is one of mm -hmm. the only fights that really stands out for me, because I was able to see it on TV. I, I don't buy the pay for you. And that was Spinks versus Ali in 78. And when you said going to the body, Spinks used that same strategy against Ali to wrest the title from him. And I don't know why I can remember all this off the top of my head. Exactly. February of 78. And of course, the following fight, Spinks loses it. But that night, he kind of used the same strategy against Ali, mm -hmm. who was, you know, maybe at the end of, of his great career, but mm -hmm. still being beaten to a pulp underneath and on mm -hmm. the shoulders as well. Uh, Howard, I, just again, uh, just going through this, the fights he lost, he went the distance. I would say about 90% of the time he lost the 12 time. rounds. He lost 13 rounds. Uh, never does he, with, uh, like I said, a couple of the uh, knockouts, uh, and I think maybe there were six total that he was actually knocked out of the ring. But even then, I think he went like seven, eight rounds. And like you said, he just was indefatigable. Mm -hmm. He just, just kept going back for more and more and more. Yeah. There's one kind of well-known fight. that It was one of his fights that he fought Tony Canzanieri in which he was indeed knocked out in the third round. Mackie Kidberg looks full of fight, still moving forward all the time. Canzanieri backing off slightly. Good right hand by Cantoneri. Berg may have been hurt. He's recovered now. A left and a right, and down goes Berg. A tremendous smash. Jackie Kid Berg trying to get to his feet. He's being counted out. Tony Cantoneri ready to continue. Berg still trying to get up, and it's all over. He was KO'd by Tony Cantoneri with that right hand smash following that left hook. So that's about about one of the worst of it, if you will. But in his first fight against Cantoneri, he won the fight. He won by, uh, by points. Okay. And then in his second fight, he lost by a, by a knockout in the third round. And then in his third fight against Cantoneri, um, which he thinks he really did win, um, and maybe he did, because in New York State, um, there was a rule that said that a low blow was not sufficient basis to disqualify a fighter entirely from the entire fight. In other words, in many jurisdictions, if a fighter hit somebody with a low blow, they, that's it. They would lose the fight on a disqualification. In New York State, 
the most that a referee could do to sanction a fighter for a low blow was to award that round to the opponent. And that happened in that third Consonary fight where Consonary hit him with six low blows. And he should have actually lost six rounds that way. And I believe he may have lost some of those rounds. And indeed, the press, after the fight and all of the press reports, gave the fight to Berg. But uh, the referees decided in a, you know, in a decision that it would go to Consonary. And that fight would have given him the lightweight championship of the world in addition to the junior welterweight championship. And I believe the fight that you're talking about is his, his number 84. And Consonary, when, when you were saying about him, he was not a tomato can. Ready oh, for this? He was a great fighter. 141, 24, 10 with 44 KOs. That's right. So you're not talking about some guy that... You're talking about a seasoned pro, uh, much probably like him in, in maybe probably style and, uh, and lack of a better word, brutality. Because there's a there, boxers are a special breed of athlete. To be able to take this kind of punishment and to do it, to, uh, I, I, I couldn't do it to my worst enemy. And yet here they just beating each other to a pulp. And yeah. then actually shaking hands after it. right. it's it's just a remarkable testament to their athleticism and their sportsmanship as well. Well, actually, Jack was quite friendly with Kid Chocolate after their fighting career. So there, there's definitely you know things that happened in the ring, um, and things that happened out of the ring. Um, actually, uh, Tony Consonari was a pretty hard puncher. He was a very powerful puncher. His style was quite different from Jack's okay. in that sense that that he was much more the heavy puncher and not so much of this kind of head down windmill type of approach which is what jack used to wear his opponents down tony was would hit you with a you know a brick if you will of a, <laughs> of a punch and uh, you know jack certainly endured a number of those punches from from tony consonary but he kept standing for most of the time you know except for in that second fight where he where he was knocked out um, and there were some very special you know circumstances surrounding that and he does lose to consonary i think his overall record if i have this right I think he faced him twice or three times. Three only. times altogether. Three times. So, he, so he won one. one fight. He won the first fight. On lost points, the other one. And, and lost the, the, the other two. So the second fight was so the knockout. Into, yep. and the third fight was uh, he lost on points in 15 rounds. And here it is. And, and that was actually mm -hmm. his 105th fight where he lost. But he comes right back and beats a guy by the name of uh, Baldo in a knockout Yep. in fight 106. So, I mean, he got right up literally off uh, the canvas and, and continued and like I said I don't know I, I didn't do this at what age did he t retire from the ring right yeah so that's a good question so he, he retired his last fight I believe professional fight was in 19 I think it was 1945 okay. 1945 I think was his last fight and he did serve uh, and he in the military that. yes he served in the Royal Air Force around 1940 or so. Okay, so he lost maybe some, some time there. So now, even after coming out of the great you know, World War II, he's fighting again, and it looks like, I may be wrong on this, but I'm, I have it as fight one, 192. He faces a fellow by the name of McDonald mm -hmm. and knocks him out. In fact, in two of his last three fights, they were knockouts. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, so he's, he was he's leaving on a... High note. <laughs> he left on a high note, but you know it was it was interesting because like he was you know at this point he was not the same fighter that he was when he was a younger man. I mean he wasn't a really old guy by any means. I think he he finished his career at age oh about thirty six or so, which is not that old. old. But he started remember he started fighting professionally at age fourteen or fifteen, so he had a long career. You know, but by the end he wasn't you know he wasn't fighting top level opponents, but. Um, you know, he still, he held his own, but his wife, by this time he was married and he okay. had a child, um, and uh, his wife really wanted him to quit because he, she didn't want him to get hurt. And, and, and uh, he had this kind of view that he could keep on fighting indefinitely. So that was one of the things that was really interesting about Jack as, as a person, as, a, as well as as a fighter. He never wanted to give up, either in the ring, in an individual <laughs> fight, nor his entire boxing career. He believed that he could keep on fighting and still beat the young kids from Premier Land back when he was 15 <laughs> years old, by the time he was 35, 40 years old, and beyond. And even as an older man, when he was in his 70s, and he came back to the United States to uh, attend Ray Arcel's 90th birthday wow. party, 
he, he actually got into a little bit of a, almost a scuffle with some young kids in the neighborhood of uh, Upper Manhattan near where the old polo grounds were. Uh, and he kept saying, you know, I could, I could lick any of these kids now. And he was probably about 78 or something at the time. Um, so he, he didn't want to let go of his youth. He believed in his power and his strength and his ability to be a champion. He believed he never lost his actual title, in fact. Um, he kept considering himself the champion for his entire career, and he wanted to retain also his celebrity status for his whole career. He wanted to be um, somebody who would hang out with Hollywood figures and with other top celebrities and be seen as a celebrity. And you know, again, I don't know, this is just prescient by you. After World War II, he fought 22 more times, and he goes 18 and four. Yep. With seven knockouts. Pretty good record. Pretty good record. Now, you gave me a, a, a brilliant segue. Let's talk about him, uh, because he's not just a, a pug or a boxer. He has a pretty entertaining life and really, really um, an electrifying life out of the ring and out of the gym. And I'm going to let you take it from there. Yes. What is he doing outside right. the ring? Because if he stays in shape, even though it seems like he is a party guy. Oh, yeah. Well, he certainly was kind of a party guy. He, you know, he spent a lot of time um, going to speakeasies and um, going to, to different sorts of nightclubs and spending time with different women of different, you know, uh, social classes, shall we say, <laughs> um, and um, but also, you know, hanging around with celebrity figures. He was reputed to have had an affair with the famous actress, celebrity Mae West, okay. who was quite a bit older than him, but he nevertheless had a little affair with her. He also had an affair with uh, the mistress of the notorious Prohibition era gangster Legs Diamond. Um, her name was Kiki Roberts. And they, had, they were living in the same hotel, in the Harding Hotel on West 55th Street during his American fights in the late 1920s, early 30s, around that time when he was coming back and forth between England and the United States to have his fights. So, you know, he happened to, to run into Kiki Roberts and started having a little flirtation with her and started up a little thing with her. And uh, Legs Diamond wasn't too happy. So he sent his goons up to my cousin's hotel room with machine guns to try to kill him. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, there was, he, they, they uh, worked up my cousin's brother, Willie, smacked him around quite a bit and threatened him. And, uh, you know, Jack barely got out of there with his life, actually. Wow. Uh, so uh, that, was, that was quite a scene. Um, he actually married a showgirl. His first marriage was to a, a woman named Bunty Payne, who was a showgirl in England. Um, was she from Ireland? Moya, his second Moya. wife, okay. was of Irish background. All right. Um, Bunty, I believe, was, was English. I'm not 100% sure about that, okay. but I, I think so. And um, how did he meet her? I'm not sure exactly how he met her, um, but you know, obviously he was hanging around with various you know, celebrity figures, going to shows, um, being in nightclubs and whatnot, and I think he ultimately met her in, in one of these okay. ways um, yeah. and married her, but very briefly, mm -hmm. um, and um, then eventually married Moya, whom he stayed married to for the rest of, of her life. Um, she passed away before he did, um, and they had a daughter together named Stephanie, um, whom I've met. Stephanie is a, a wonderful sculptor okay. uh, who lives in France, and I've had the, the opportunity to meet her as really? well. She's a lovely person. and um, So, um, yeah, he had, he had that part of his life, but uh, you know, he may have he may have possibly have had a little fling with Lupe Velez. There was a, a one of his fights, I believe, it was the uh, Mushi Callahan uh, championship fight, where Lupe Velez, the actress, the Spanish or Mexican actress, Mexican, right. uh, was in the audience there and was yelling out, "Atta boy, atta boy, yeah, go get him!" You know, kind of stuff. You know, and you could hear her in the background apparently, and so it makes you wonder whether or not they may have actually have also had a little little fling. It's it's hard to know for sure, right. but he, he definitely was involved with a lot of people. He was a movie actor as well, so he was cast in a film in 1932-33 called Money Talks. Okay. Um, the story of that movie is based on um, a novel by um, 
Lewis Golding called Magnolia Street. And it, um, the subject material for the story actually is quite reminiscent of Mel Brooks's The Producers. So it, it's about um, a, a businessman um, who uh, sells his business to his sort of rival part, uh, you know, kind of business owner, and then um, is going to planning to retire on the proceeds of the sale of this business. So he's got quite a bit of money. And, uh, but then he finds out that he stands to inherit a very large sum of money, providing he can show that he really doesn't need it. So he basically has to divest himself of his resources. Um, so he sets out to lose all of his money by gambling on things that he thinks he's going to lose on, including creating a terrible <laughs> musical that he's quite sure will be a flop, but it turns out to be a success. <laughs> and also, you know, backing the career of Kid Burke, who is a thinly veiled character name for Kid Berg, obviously, played by Jack in the film, uh, who is the son of his business rival, uh, Jaime Berkowitz. Uh, so that's where the connection of Burke, Berkowitz and Berg all kind of com come together. And so Jack appears in this film, um, and he's the real sort of, um, you know, heartthrob type of character, but, but a great boxer who wins his fight. Um, and so, yeah. But he does play out of the boxing role because he is a member of We Few, We Happy Few, We Band of Brothers. And this, uh, never realized, he was uh, on a horse riding in the movie Henry V. That's right. Uh, in the Battle of Agincourt. And right. obviously playing out of camp. I don't know whether he had any lines in this, but I bet you he probably would have been a natural actor uh, on, either on stage or in film, probably could have done it. Well, if you look at some of his videos of his interviews of where he's making presentations and whatnot and talking to the cameras, you know, press type of situations, he's very affable and very um, conversational and very um, good on camera. I think he, 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 he would have been a very good actor. I mean, most well, he had of his, good looks. Yes, uh, he had great looks. Right. And, but most of his roles were relatively small roles, either as stuntman or as you know, minor characters. So he, he also is in the film The Square Ring, uh, 1953, with Joan Collins. He played a referee at this point, so he was already retired from boxing at this point. <laughs> He was in another similar kind of boxing film called Panic, uh, where he also played a referee. He played a Hasidic Jew in the <laughs> film Listomania uh, in the night around the early 1970s. He was also uh, a villager in the original film of Fiddler on the Roof. Um, he was in quite a few films. He was on in the Carry On uh, now, series that of the films. Now is that the '71? Uh, Fiddler right. on the Roof because I've, right. I've seen that that's, that's right. why he so now I got, film. have a reason now to watch it again and looking his for him. final film was a role in a film called The Craze which uh, starred the two members of Spandau Ballet the uh, synth pop band from the 80s and 90s and it's the story of the Cray twins who were the main gangsters in London's East End in the 60s and 70s um, and there's a scene that was filmed in the Repton Boys Boxing Club in East London where a lot of young boxers trained um, and where the Crays in this scene were actually seen fighting because the Cray twins started out as boxers, professional boxers. Uh, so hence the connection between boxing and, uh, and the, the world of gangland London. So Jack actually appears in that scene as well as one of the spectators standing around ringside and you see him sitting, standing there with a, a cigar sticking out of his mouth and he's, he's watching the, the Cray's fight. And actually many of the people who were British boxers uh, ended up becoming bodyguards for the Cray twins. They were sort of idolized by the London ex-boxers community. So for example, as you mentioned before, Henry V, one of his fellow stuntmen, Jack's fellow stuntmen, was a fellow named Nasher Powell, who was a bodyguard for the Cray twins. And um, Jack certainly knew, knew the Crays and so forth and so on. Interesting. So very colorful. Now, he time. didn't stay with Hollywood, per se. He, he probably did something after that as well. Um, I, yeah, he, you know, he ran some, some various kinds of restaurants and things like that. You know, he had little businesses that he, he would run. I'm sure he had enough money to live on pretty, 
pretty reasonably. I mean, the, the kind of salaries that boxers made in, the, in his day were nowhere near the kind mm. of scale that they would make in, in current times. But I, I, he, I think he lived comfortably. He was able to buy. You know, really, it comes back to, to what we talked about at the beginning about you know, why boxers became boxers. Well, mm. he was able to support his family. He was able to buy homes for his siblings and um, you know, support his parents, buy homes for his parents, uh, make a wedding for his sister, for example. So he lived you know, pretty comfortably in, in that way and he had, a, you know, he had various so little business ventures. Howard, did he move to the United States though after his career or during his no. career? No. He always maintained, he was, he was from England. That's right. He was from England and he maintained a place in, in England, but he did spend large parts of his career living, essentially living in the United States. He would set up himself up in a hotel, like, for example, the Harding Hotel that I mentioned right. earlier. And he would just live there for a few months while he was fighting, you know, six months or something. He would do a stint in the United States doing a bunch of fights and, and then go back to England for a little while to okay. be, visit his family and, you know, be at, be at home. Um, yeah, so he yeah. was back and forth. For a guy with, um, you know, very successful when you think about it from the roots that he came you know an immigrant probably parents had to learn english didn't speak it who knows whether they spoke russian or ukrainian or polish or all three but still had to maintain learn english uh to move up i mean it's it's an unbelievable it's a fairy tale uh type of thing yeah. from you know and, and he should be commended for that it, it just goes to show you what you can do Tough and of road. course he, yeah and maybe he maybe he was um you know, he used his fists instead of maybe, but still had to have a brain because he's able to really um, maneuver his way. Yeah. And certain a bit, you know, and this, I, I think what people sometimes don't realize with athletes, they have that indefatigable attitude where they can win and, and they're confident in anything that they do. And he showed it, went to Hollywood. Uh, was maybe a, a restaurant owner, did all things outside the ring, and used boxing to uh, elevate other things in his life. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah. So. Yeah, he had, a, he had a good life, a good career. Um, definitely had a lot of fun in his time. I think he was, he was a real <laughs> man of the 20s and 30s, of a time that, that was an exciting... Uh, partying kind of time in, in, in our history, in American and in British history, when people really enjoyed life. The Roaring Twenties was his time when he was a young man and he really enjoyed the fruits of his labor. I mean, if you think about it, you know, young men these days, I mean, what kind of young men are able to enjoy the kinds of things that he was able to do with his life when they're such young people? But he worked at it. Oh, he and worked see, really and, and hard. And that's what um, we have to remember is that he was willing to literally bleed in order to, uh, you know, move up and, and make a name for himself, yeah. which he did. Yeah. So. yeah. so I wanted to just talk a little bit about some, a few more things sure. having to do with his career. So just, you know, kind of to briefly summarize, you know, he, he started out, as I said, um, fighting at Premier Land as a featherweight, not as a lightweight. So he was even a lighter weight. Um, and he, he took on his name Kid Berg because he idolized another fighter, another Jewish boxer who was a few years older than him, a welterweight boxer named Ted Kid Lewis. So he was looking for a name to you know, fight under. He didn't want to use Bergman either way, so he shortened it to Berg, but he wanted to have that kid thing in there as a tribute to Ted Kid Lewis, whom, whom he idolized. Um, so that was And a Howard, you know, on, on the different weights, I, I have to interrupt you on that because I didn't realize this. There were a couple of fights where he was underweight <laughs> and ate almost right before the fights and then fought. And I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, where he's eating a protein bar. I mean, he's eating full meals to get to get up to mm. maybe that required weight. Well, actually, he had more of a problem staying within the, the weight, weight limits because he was actually not a natural lightweight. He was really a natural welterweight. That was kind of like what he really should have been. So he had to really work hard to keep his weight down enough to even qualify for even light welterweight and certainly had to really work hard um, to qualify for some of his lightweight fights. So there were some times where he literally, one fight where he came in, he was literally an ounce and a half over weight 
to qualify mm -hmm. as, I believe, a lightweight at the time. So he went out, you know, he, he was given a little bit of time to go lose a few ounces oh, that day. <laughs> and he, you know, ran around, did all kinds of exercises and whatnot, and, and lost that ounce and a half, and he was, he made it. And, and as you're saying that, you're talking about the welterweight because he beats a guy by the name of Bunker and wins the Bermuda welterweight championship. Yes, that was a little <laughs> bit later on. I just love things yeah. like that. Yeah. It's, it's so great that they name things after the islands or, you know, they, and it's not made up per no, se, but it's, it's just a lot of fun how they, they come up with these titles. And obviously he was there. He beat Bunker uh, yeah. in a knockout again. I, I, I think maybe that could have been another nickname for him, but uh, just goes to show you that he was able to go through the different classes and win a number of uh, ways and uh, fights that way. Mm-hmm. Yep. So um, then he, while he was a teenager, still fighting as a featherweight, he fought some of the great British fighters, like, for example, British featherweight champions, that people who either went on to become champion or had been champion. So, for example, Johnny Cuthbert he fought, okay. Johnny Curley, and Harry Corbett. These were the three great featherweights of their time and um, you know they became all of them became featherweight champions and he fought them and beat them now was misler because he beats misler mm -hmm. as well he actually knocked them out twice i believe and misler was 63 16 with 20 knockouts yes was he also first of all i think he was english he was english and jewish and jewish that's right harry misler. okay mm -hmm. and uh, the only reason i bring that up he, he beats him in I, I like to do it this way, in his 124th uh, fight, and actually his 107th win. But And the only reason I, I bring this up is that, you know, he continues to fight guys with really good records. He never shies from any guy. That's right. he, he's willing to play any, uh, fight anybody, anytime, anywhere, at any weight. Um, so, Misler was a younger fighter. He was about three years younger than Jack. He was an up-and-coming fighter. He hadn't yet really had very many fights, but he had won just about all of them, if not all of them, um, at the time. And he became, uh, Misler became British lightweight champion. So, in 1934, after Jack had had a few little disappointments, you know, with, for example, the Consonary fight, and he was in a little bit of a somewhat downward uh, position with his, his career. He came back to England and he fought Misler for the British lightweight title and he beat him. Now the story is with that fight is actually Misler, you know, during the course of that fight itself, he apparently injured his hands quite a bit. So he really wasn't up to snuff and but Jack really took advantage of that. And if you see the actual footage, which we'll show some clips from, oh, good. you'll see the style of fighting that Jack has where his arms are just like pistons and he's going at Misler relentlessly head down, bang, 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 to the point where Misler just steps out of the way at one point, and you see Jack actually fall right through the <laughs> ropes, so I'm practically out of the ring from this. He's just so forward moving. Kidberg soon takes the offensive and surprises the champion with his two-handed attack. Misler has continually rushed to the ropes and takes heavy punishment. In the tenth round, with damaged hands, Misler is forced to retire, the referee emphasizing the champion's failure by throwing the towel in the air. And just um, to state this, if you think that the Misler one was he won it by luck because of an injury and stuff, no, his it next luck. two fights, he beats uh, Bastin and uh, Hummery, both knockouts. Yes, Gustav so Hummery. it wasn't it wasn't like um, illegitimate winning mm -hmm. by you know uh, an injury for your opponent. Oh, right. no, I mean, he just not. maintained bang Absolutely. bang two more knockouts. Absolutely. In, in fact, during that, I, I, I was even looking at this now. As he got older, the knockouts came a little bit fewer yeah. and farther between. But at, he just would have runs where he would just win by knockouts. Like uh, his win, 45, all the way down. It, it, he won four out of five fights by knockouts. Uh, he won, 
let's say one, two, three, four, five, six. He won six fights in a row where he had knockout. I mean, he's on fire that way. And I'm yes. not saying that other champions haven't done that. Sure. I just always think that the lighter the weight, I, I always think it's the harder to do yeah. because I, I – and maybe I'm being naive saying this, but I, I always feel that the, the lighter the weights, they can move around the ring much faster, fleeter, almost like gazelles where you have the heavyweights. They're almost like lumbering, and I, I shouldn't, and that's a bad adjective to use. Well, I think there's some truth for it. The heavyweights tend not to move as quickly, but the heavyweights also punch a lot a harder. Heart. You get hit by a, a serious heavyweight champion-level punch, you get hit the wrong way, it can it can kill you easily. I mean, it's ver- they're very extreme, and nobody is completely immune to that. So, you know, when you're talking about the lighter weight class, is like the type that, you know, Jack was in, in light welterweight, junior welterweight, or lightweight classes. You know, the kind of punching levels, it's, it's an order of magnitude lighter than, you know, somebody like, uh, you know, a George Foreman or a Muhammad Ali or any of these other, you know, bigger fighters certainly true. And, and, you know, even though Ali was a kind of rope-a-dope, kind of move-around sort of guy, um, you know, it, it's not quite on the same level of speed that you have with somebody like Jack Kidberg, right. who was really, really fast in, in and, his punches. And as I'm just doing this, uh, I, I, I'm just looking on his first couple of pages here, because there's 25 spots for each one, uh, Howard. I would say that of those 50 fights that I have right on this page, I would say about 30 of them are knockouts. And yep. that, that's, you can't ask for more from a boxer. That's right. That's right. So. He, was, he, was, he was something else. So anyway, you know, after he fought some of these early fights against these featherweights, he, he came over to the United States. In 1928 was his first trip over. And he fought a fighter named Pedro Amador and beat him on points. And then he fought to a split decision draw first um, against a Chicago fighter named Billy Patrol. And then he lost on a um, technical knockout to, to, to Billy Patrol. So his first big And he really, was 1-1-1. One, one, and one. I didn't mean yeah, to interrupt. That's he right. was 1-1-1 one, one, and one against him. Correct. His, his first big breakthrough fights in the U.S. was when he beat a guy named Bruce Flowers for the second time in May of 1929 at Madison Square Garden. So that was what got him his title shot against Canzanieri. And then he fought Flowers again in October of 29, and he won that one as well. So Flowers was quite a, a fighter, actually. You know, he was, this is, these are contender-level fighters. And he was unbeaten against Flowers. That's I, right. I just, he was 3-0 and against That's him right. lifetime. And then to begin his fighting against M- Mushy Callahan, whom he eventually beat <laughs> for the uh, World junior welterweight title, he fought Callahan first at Ebbets Field in okay. 1929, and he beat him on points, Bush Callahan. Yep. And then he beat a guy named Phil McGraw in September of 29 in, in Detroit. He pounded the heck out of him, and he beat him in 10 rounds, and that led to this guy McGraw retiring from boxing. So that's how badly wow. he beat McGraw. So the big problem that Jack had in terms of his getting these titles. I mean, he really could have and should have been lightweight champion of the world. But for the fact that because he was from England, American promoters did not want to let their fighters fight a British fighter and risk losing the world title to a foreigner. So they kind of like avoided having fights with him. They would set these ridiculous terms and not let him get a chance at these fighters. So he was supposed to fight um, lightweight champion Sammy Mandel, uh, and then eventually fight the uh, contender and eventual champion, a guy named Al Singer, um, for world titles. But these fights, the Al Singer and the um, Mandel fight, never happened because they couldn't come to terms about it. And so it was just, it just, it was sad because Jack could have become right. the lightweight champion sooner, right away. You know, world lightweight. And champion. there it goes back to the marketing, and we're not letting our guy. Yeah. We're making money off. Right. They didn't want to share some the profits. guy from England and all the rest. Of it. They didn't want to and, share the profits. And just for edification, uh, Callahan was again no tomato can. No. 49, 16, and three, 16 knockouts at that point. Yep. And. Um, Berg was 2-0 and against him. That's right. That's right. Unbelievable. So then what happened was in 1930, January of 1930, was the first fight with Consonary. He fought Consonary at Madison Square Garden, and he won by a split decision, decision. in that fight. Although Consonary was actually favored to win the fight, but Jack won. 
slight upset then. And he was getting beaten pretty badly, actually, Jack was, in the first round. But he turned it around, and he came back, and he, what he was doing, he was a little bit more flat-footed at the beginning of this fight. He was just kind of fighting in a more traditional way. And then he, after the first round, where he was starting to lose, he changed tactics to his usual windmill tactics. Wore Consonari down, and he gave him these alternating left jabs, left jabs, left jabs, right jabs to various spots. The windmill approach all over, up and down, around like that. Oh, stop right there, because you know what? I did not ask you yes. the Whitechapel windmill. Who gave him the nickname and what it referred to? And you kind of yes. elaborated on it. So tell everybody. I don't know who actually gave him the name, the Whitechapel windmill or the Whitechapel whirlwind, but those were, those were the names that he was known by. Whitechapel windmill um, in Britain and in the United States, he was known as the Whitechapel whirlwind. Interesting. Uh, but basically the same concept. Uh, I, I suspect this came probably from from the press or maybe from his managers. I'm not sure. I think it's probably a press description. Right. You know, these kinds of nicknames come up uh, and you don't know exactly how they come and, up. And, and obviously it referred to his approach in... That's right. right. The wind-up... The windmill, the piston-like approach, yep. very fast and punching from all different angles above, sideways, around like this, but like a windmill going around in circle, relentless. Instead of just kind of like going, you know, like that, a jab here or there, another right or something like that, it was a relentless flow of punches. You know, it's interesting. I would love to be able to go back in time, and I I'm like this, um, why he chose that flat-footed approach in the first round. What was he thinking? Did Don't he know. Almost like... Maybe he was thinking that the opponent was expecting the windmill, so he maybe did a little change. I mean, this is, the, this is what I'm talking about. This is the strategy that's employed by boxers. Sometimes you go the unorthodox way by doing something that you're not norm, yeah. normally uh, known to do, and then he said, oh, that's not working. I'm just yeah. going, going I don't, this I way. I don't know why he chose a slightly though. different approach that first, first round. But obviously, he must have realized that it wasn't working, or maybe his corner people realized that it wasn't working, and they said, <laughs> go out there and you. do your usual yeah, thing. And it's, yeah. So that's, that's what happened. <laughs> so then, anyway, he, he fought Mushy Callahan and won the, the World uh, Junior Welterweight Champion in 1930, um, in February, at the Royal Albert Hall. Um, and uh, he really gave, gave Callahan quite a beating. Callahan ended up with a broken nose and a swollen eye from that fight. It was wow. pretty, pretty bad. So he held that junior welterweight title from February 1930 to April of 1931. Then um, during this time, while he was world junior welterweight, he was also fighting people at the lightweight level. So he was, that's when he was fighting you know, people like Kid Chocolate, too. So he fought Kid Chocolate at the Polo Grounds in August of 1930 and beat him there. And you're talking about him having to drop weight. That's and right. it sounds like right. oh two three pounds it's not it's a lot it's a lot a lot of running a lot. a lot of a lot of training there's some great films that you can find on on the internet of him training actually it's, they're 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 remarkable kid berg is in training for his fight at the theater royal dublin on march the 8th he's going to meet paddy rush the irish middleweight champion over 10 rounds and if this is how he's going to meet him we hope paddy will be pleased berg has made a big comeback one of the greatest all-action welterweights England ever produced, he nearly brought home the championship of the world three times. He is matched with Eric Boone, but in the Irishman he's bound to have a tough fight. As a matter of fact, Rush nearly beat him at Southampton recently, so that the return bout in Dublin is sure to provide a great fight with plenty of fireworks. Here are some to go on with. Good luck, kid. You're not an iceberg anyway. So then he beat, um, as I said, he beat Kid Chocolate in 1930 at the yep. Polo Grounds, and then he fought Patrol um, again at Madison Square Garden in October 1930, and he beat him on points again. So this was, again, not a, uh, a light puncher. Billy Patrol was a very powerful fighter, really good puncher, heavy puncher, and Jack beat him. He wore him down. 
So then, um, yeah, so then he, he fought Consonary in um, April of 1931. He was then the junior welterweight champion, and um, Consonary at the time was the lightweight champion. So this fight was actually for both the junior welterweight title and the lightweight titles. But that's where Jack lost by the knockout in the third round. But Jack didn't consider that he had actually lost the junior welterweight title, but clearly he hadn't won the lightweight title right. from him. So he, he sort of thought he was still a junior welterweight champion. And it's interesting. Because officially it was, you know, it would be arguable that whether it was or wasn't really for the title, the junior welterweight title. And you know what? It's funny. Um, Consonary bookends, he, he, there were two losses to him. And they are bookended around one, two, three, four, five, six successive. I would love to just see what tactics were. What did Consonary do differently than the other? Was he just? Um, yeah. And I, I can't see him being a better boxer per se, as much as, you know. Was there one? He was. I would a love to see it. Puncher. Was there one round where you say, okay? He wins this round, and maybe that is the yeah. turning point in the yeah. fight. It's I just think, interesting. I think in the in the knockout fight, you know, it was well, it was only the third round that Jack lasted in, in that fight. So he hit, you know, he hit him pretty hard, right? And he he laid him out flat on the canvas. So I mean, Jack must have opened himself up once or twice, and Tony Consonari got it uh, one of his very very powerful heavy punches. Again, Tony Consonari was a heavy puncher, uh, not like not like Jack. So he, you know, he relied on that heavy punch, and if Jack got hit just the wrong way, he went down. Unfortunately. And like you said, but in that second Jack loss, he goes said, to distance. Though, Go Jack actually said that in that knockout fight, the reason that he lost the fight, he blamed it on the fact that he was fooling around with a woman right before the fight. And so that's what he said was the reason that he lost that fight. So whatever strategy might have been involved here for Consonary or whatever mistakes Jack may have made in his boxing strategy, if we take what Jack said to be true, it's very possible that he you know, really was, and I'm not sure if you could say that it was just the fooling around, but maybe you could say more broadly, he was partying a little bit too much before this fight. Right. And uh, he just wasn't quite up to it that time. And obviously he, he probably doesn't do that the second time around, even though he loses. But he, uh, but right. he does go the distance. Well, he did go the distance in that in their third fight together in 1931. Now you can certainly find the footage of the Consonary second fight online. You can you know, that's available. Howard, where was he from? Was he American? Ta Consonary? Tony Consonary was a, a, a Italian American. Okay. I believe he grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. And uh, but he was yeah he was also grew up in poverty and fought his way out of poverty to become a successful boxer. And he had quite a boxing career. Uh, eventually he ran a you know a bar and then he sort of had some weird like little kind of almost like vaudeville like acts that he was doing to cash in on his fame you know during the latter part right. of his career um, but yeah so and there was even an encounter supposedly that happened between Consonary and Jack years later after the fight so w when Jack went to Tony Consonary's uh, bar and restaurant and ran into him there and you know basically he Consonary admitted that he had no choice but to, to give him the low blows, and that's why he won the fight. <laughs> wow. And you know what's interesting yeah. is that really of his whole career, the second fight with Concieri, where he goes the distance, he does beat um, Body or Bandy in the next round, technical mm -hmm. knockout, a KO, uh, but he loses three of his next four fights, but then goes on a run where he gets uh, four successive wins, yep. all knockouts. It's almost like, uh, you know, it's like a, a baseball pitcher having, I, I, I think of it this way, uh, Seaver goes 11-11 11 and 11 in 74 and then comes back. Yes. You know, he's injured, rebuilds himself, yep. retools himself and all the rest of it. And resurrects his career. So, and it looks like he does the same thing yeah. here. Jack was a little bit down after that, um, you know, after the, the Consonary loss um and i think he you know then um because he loses to another italian here right. uh, i think italian locatelli and then he yes. starts his wins he Cleo beats sorens so, okay, so, yes. all right he beats sorens rose mm -hmm. uh Drowin, i think his name is and harry wallace mm -hmm. uh and of those four guys he never lost to sorens or wallace had a 2-0 record against them. now it doesn't sound like a lot uh 2-0 2-0 <laughs> <laughs> let's face it if I got beat twice, I don't want to face you a third time. <laughs> so maybe, you know, that was it. But like I said, he, he goes through and emerge, loses to Tony Falco, mm -hmm. and then goes on this 
uh, like a resurgence where yep. then he wins the next four or five yep. fights. And he beat six. Kid Chocolate a second time, time in 1932. So that was after the Consonary losses in 1931. Uh, he came back and he beat Kid Chocolate for the second time in 1932. So he was still fighting pretty good, you know, and even though he had a little bit of a down period after the Consonary loss. Um, but he built himself back up yeah. again. He didn't give up. That was like Jack. He just didn't give up. And he forged a, a really good, you were saying this off air, he forged a really good relationship with Kid Chocolate. Am yes, I correct? Yes, he did. He did. He was, uh, good, he was good friends, friends with him. Friends in and yeah. outside. The, yeah. and, I'm a, and again, this goes back to my, my whole thing. A boxer mentality has got to be so different from other athletes because I'm your friend. Now i got to go beat you, That's you right. to a pulp. I can't imagine the kind of mind shift that one has to go through to do that. It's really remarkable. Right. But, you know, like in any profession, if you're a lawyer, for example, you're in court and you're fighting against an opponent who's a, another lawyer, and then you go out afterwards for beers right. and you hang out together. So, you know, it does happen. There are professions where people oppose each other and fight, you know, <laughs> vigorously against one another. But in the end, they, they go out and have a beer together like, you know, like the show does. Like, <laughs> basically. And you just brought up, I'm watching Adam's Rib yesterday with Spencer Tracy and Catherine. And not only are they lawyers... But they're married each other, and they're on the same case, sure. arguing obviously opposite. So, <laughs> I I get the um, the connection there. Well, so if you you know, speaking of statistics, you know, I know you like to, to talk about statistics a lot. So here's an interesting one, okay? Okay. So in the Misler fight, all right, Berg threw 150 punches per round, is what he averaged during that fight. Just to give you an idea of the sheer number of punches that he was throwing. And how many rounds did it go? Well, uh, that's a good question. I can't remember if it was... Let's just say it went five. That's no, it was 700. more rounds. Yeah, it was more rounds than that. I think it was a... No, actually, I can't remember. It was a technical knockout. I think... No, I think it was eight rounds, actually. All right, I was like, so you're talking about, about... Ready for this? That's four. That's, uh, what, um, 300, 600? That's 1,200 punches. Can you imagine doing this? Right, so I have another little oh. statistic here. I think it's, uh, if, I, if I've got this correct here. And that was his 150th win, Misler. Right. I have Misler, he defeated me, and this is the 150th episode. So, well, we're so, making that so connection. I, if I remember correctly, <laughs> I, I think it was something like in, in his fight against um, Tony Consonari, it was something like 2,400 punches oh for God. Berg to like 1,400 punches thrown by Consonari. So that just gives you a, an idea of the kind of sheer volume of punches that Jack would throw the, in his, in his and fights. And really, uh, boxing, you know, the savagery of it and, and how hard that is. And, yeah, they're three-minute rounds. You get get the rest, but then you got to come out and redo that. Oh, yep. it's They're just incredible yeah. athletes. Another little sort of interesting thing about, you know, I talked a little bit about how Jack was such a relentless fighter and how one of the reasons he was so successful is he had tremendous stamina. He could stay in the ring 15 rounds against somebody against a relentless onslaught of very heavy punches. So what gave Jack his his amazing stamina was he he was known for being able to hold his breath underwater for an absolutely ridiculous amount of time. He could go underwater. Like a Houdini. And, yeah, like a Houdini like <laughs> character. So he apparently had extremely enormous lung capacity. That was something he was born with this gift of lung capacity that allowed him to I think was really a lot of what was responsible for his boxing style of this relentless because you can't maintain this flow of punches the way he did unless you have tremendous stamina and you can't have that kind of stamina unless you have tremendous lung capacity. And Howard, he must have had zero percent body fat. I, right. I mean, it, it's just the, the shape. Not. Well, the shape that you got to be in. He was a tall fight. guy for a, a for a lightweight. He was five foot nine. Okay. So if you think about it. Uh, you know, most lightweights, let's say a Tony Consonari, I think he was more like about five foot six or so. So Berg was, a, was quite had a bit the reach, taller. Obviously. He had the reach, but he was a bit taller than Consonari because he was such a, a slim and toned fellow, Jack was. And, you know, when you think about it with the windmill, and, of course, I'm no boxing expert, but if you're coming at this and let's just say you have uh, the reach advantage, I mean, how does your opponent even navigate to get in at least one punch let alone a flurry of punches to to wreck some damage on you it's that's why well, he had 61 yeah. KOs. The, the reach certainly, I'm sure that could have been a factor, especially against some of his, his smaller opponents. Actually, Misler was, I think, a little bit taller, taller. than Jack. 
he was younger at, than Jack at the time, so therefore he may have been even a little trimmer than Jack was, because by this time, uh, when he fought Misler for the British lightweight title in 1934 at the Royal Albert Hall, Jack would have been about 25. Whereas Misler, I think at that time, let's see, he was born in 1912, so he would have been about 22, and earlier in his career, and he was a little taller, so he was probably a little bit even slimmer than Jack at that point, you know. And for anyone, again, and, and this just goes back to what we're reinforcing, is that any advantage that he had was offset Misler's age. He was a little bit taller than mm -hmm. him, and yet, like I said before, he was unbeaten against Misler. And uh, as we make that, at one point, I think Misler, no, he was 63 and 16 over his career. So again, yes, you're talking about really a guy winning over 75% of his fights. Yep. And he dominated him. Well, two wins. Right. You got to be able to say you're dominating right. the guy. So getting back to Kid Chocolate, you know, just to give you, you know, in terms of the type of level of fighter that he was, and you were mentioning about like, you know, how what a great fighter Misler was. So when Jack fought Kid Chocolate in 1930, at this point, and he and he beat him on points. This was at the Polo okay. Grounds. Kid Chocolate was 19 years old at the time, mm. and he had fought 160 fights by the time he was 19. He had won every single one of his fights. He wow. was totally undefeated, 160 fights, until he met Jack. And, and how old was Jack? Jack in 1930 would have been 21. Okay. So still pretty, a, a young man. Young. young man by our standards today, but by boxing standards yes. in those days, you know, when you had people turning pro, 14, 15, 16 years old, a lot earlier than they turn pro these days. I mean, nowadays you have people who go through like golden gloves things and go to the Olympics. They're 18, 19, 20 years old before they even start to consider right. turning pro. And remember, the matches are fewer and far between because right. you don't want to, there's more invested in the, in the boxer and all. And by the way, that was box. That was his 91st first fight. If if I'm on the right thing, and Kid Chocolate, you said he was unbeaten. How many times before? 160 times, fought 160 fights before he fought Jack in 1930, undefeated, and Jack beat him for the first time. Okay, and professionally, I have Kid Chocolate as being 136, 10, and six. Amazing, and they become fast friends obviously probably respected each other in the you know sometimes you forge a relationship and there's nothing that you just say it's just athletes just being athletes and recognizing either the greatness or just have a respect I, I, you see it all the time mm -hmm. um I, I referee and there are just certain yeah. coaches you just walk in and you just have a certain respect not that you're giving them a call per se it, it, there's just a certain charisma that they have and a, a, just a certain uh, understanding of the game, um, and, and yeah. I, I believe that's what happens with boxers as yeah. well. Um, and Kid Chocolate was Cuban. Yes, and, Kid Chocolate was and, Cuban. Uh, um, so this was probably probably fought most of his fights in Cuba. Am I correct? Mm, I'm not sure about that. I think he fought pretty internationally. Kid Chocolate was a you know top level contender fighter who fought all okay. over. And he certainly fought quite a bit in the United States. He fought a lot of his fights in the United States. Okay. That's how he sort of got, got his career And really I'm just thinking uh, maybe, you know, he got home cooking for maybe the first 15. Who, who well, knows? Well, he might have. I don't, I don't know. I, I can tell but, you about um, that. But, um, but he does forge a real... And obviously, um, and I, I do like to talk about this. Well, the funny thing is I have Kid Chocolate him in number 91. And then he faced, uh, I believe, another uh, black boxer by the name of Buster Brown. Yes. Do you know anything about that Not fight? Not much. I haven't really because it was staged at um, that was Dreamland one? in in New, New Jersey. Jersey. Yeah, that's why that, that caught your eye. I guess. Yeah. Because it was New Jersey. And he yeah, was two zero against Brown. Yeah, I don't know that much about that particular fight off the top of my head. Yeah. And I couldn't find Brown's uh, record. I don't believe I don't have his yeah. overall record. But again, just just a plethora of different fighters that yep. he fought. Obviously, with different. Here's what I would love to ask. What was the most uh, one challenging fight he ever had? Did he win it? And who, of all the boxers he ever faced, was uh, the toughest for him? Because yeah. there's a difference well, between the toughest there, boxer think, and the most uh, unique. Well, uh, I think match. I think probably the two boxers that were the most difficult for Jack were Billy Patrol. Okay, one one and one. Yeah, and because he was a tough boxer, very hard hitter. 
Um, and I think he also had a tough time, of course, with, with Consonari. So Consonari was a, another tough opponent for him. But he still uh, won matches he against He won them, one of the you know? fights, and the other one, he, you, arguably, he could have said, he said that he really thought he won that third fight with Consonari based on the fouls that were committed against him um, and the press reports of the account of the fight suggested that Berg won that fight. But, you know, whether he won it or lost it narrowly, I mean, it would have been, it was a narrow loss, that third fight. He, he held his own against Cancenari, but it was a tough fight for Howard, him. Howard, I'm going to put you on a spot now. Yeah. If he were boxing today, how popular would he be? What kind of money would he be making? And would he be boxing in the United States exclusively, or would he have stayed in England? If Gosh. everything, and uh, as the viewers know with the Spark Ridge, I always love to ask that if, if, if. Anything yeah, it's, can... it's a bit speculative to, to say what would you know, be the case. There, you know, certainly there are some different conditions today, different circumstances. I think some of the ethnic rivalries today are not quite as strong no. as they were back in the day. So there might have been you know, perhaps somewhat less focus on his eth ethnicity from the standpoint of a marketing yes. um, standpoint. But he was nevertheless, you know, if he was fighting the kinds of fighters that he was fighting back in the day, and, they, and this was happening today, he would have been a champion class fighter. He would have been a world champion level fighter. So he certainly would have been getting his share of attention. Now, I think in general, nowadays, the, the lower class fighters, lower as in lower weight class fighters, um, don't get quite as much attention as the, the heavyweights. I think it's so kind of shifted towards the heavyweight focus that, the, these days. And, you know, in terms of television revenues yep. and so forth and so on, you know, we, we live in a television age. And in those days, it was more about going to the fight itself and seeing the, the drama. Now, today, it's a lot more about the, the pay-per-view and the mm -hmm. marketing aspects of things. And, the, you know, so only the sort of the highest level of... of extreme nature as, as heavyweight fights tend to be in certain respects are, are given as much attention. So, I mean, I think he certainly would have had a very successful career as a fighter and a, it would have been a champion level, but he might not have been as big of a celebrity in that same sense. Right. You know, there was, I think there's generally less of a connection these days between boxers and uh, television or film celebrities. There's more of that going on in those days. There were a lot of boxers in the 20s and 30s and 40s who were also music hall performers, so it was actually quite common for boxers to earn a little extra money by doing like a little sh show where they would do an exhibition or talk about their lives or talk about different things in these like little kind of equivalent of like a little Broadway or off-Broadway type of show to further enhance your, your profile as well as earning some extra money. So he might not have had those kinds of opportunities today, although there certainly was, you know, I believe there was a, a Mike Tyson show that happened a few years ago. So, there, you know, some, some vestiges really, of that happening. Yeah, real boxes of to, Hollywood to or something today, like that. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I think that, that would have been a little bit different. Well, one thing, and it was because he started his career so young. Today, he would probably be an Olympic champion. And you don't know where being a, a gold medalist would have propelled his career. Yeah, that was the one thing... Um, Many of our boxers today, they start with the Olympic medals right. and then they go to a career. Obviously, he couldn't. Obviously, it was not, not, not so much not important, but if you could make money in those circumstances, you were doing it. However, today, he could probably go, obviously, from the professional and become, you know, and enter the Olympics uh, today. Can you do that? Can you actually be I, a professional boxer and then go do the Olympics? Well, on, now on that a, you said uh, that, I got to look that up. Yeah, because, I'm not sure if that's true. Because we do have, you know, we have the NBA stars, the Dream Team in 92. Yeah. Uh, I don't see how you can say no to. Uh, right, the, true. Boxers versus you know, NBA have, stars. Yeah. You know, he might have had greater glory in England with, I know this sounds crazy, with Olympic medals. Um, fighting, you know, the Olympian and then boom, and then, you know, propelling. Yeah, he didn't These go for the Olympics because in those days, certainly it was the case that if you went pro, you couldn't, couldn't be in it. the Olympics. So, and he started being a pro at a very early age because he wanted to make money. Right. And he was supporting his family. You know, when he first did his first fight and he came home with a fistful of money, you know, his father was a little bit mad at him first for, for doing that. And then he saw how much money he brought home and he said, <laughs> go back out there and do it again. You know, literally, that's what he, that's what and, he did. And, I was and thinking, then speaking of, of his ahead, father and, and his family, did you know that Jack's 
younger brother, Teddy, was also a professional boxer and had an interesting career. He certainly nowhere on the level that Jack had in terms of success. He fought, you know, for a short period of time, a couple of years, he had professional fights, but he too was a boxer. And I actually have a little Go photo ahead. here, which I can hold up and show. And this is of Actually, Jack's... can I hold up this picture too, just compare sure, the two? Sure, Because it is uh, almost the um, same type of pictures. Now, their parts are different. They could almost pass for twins, don't you think? Well, they were brothers. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're yeah. right. Their, their hair parts were different. Yeah. Now, that part of Jack's with the part in the middle was a very much like the way my dad's hair was parted. Right. For many years, he had his hair like that and, and his hair slicked back and a similar shape of face. It's weird. It was like I, I used to be shocked by the appearance of Jack and, and think about how much he looked like my dad. So it really sort of... You know, and, and, and sparked me, my interest. And, and just to show everybody, here is uh, Jack Hidberg at an early age, if we can show that. And just see, um, he was able to avoid, uh, um, you know, the curses of boxing, where um, unfortunately the boxers real and their their bodies are abused. And we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, how and maybe you can even. Um, you had worked with some of the boxers and the dangers of being a boxer. And the fact that he lived so long is really a testament, I think, to his health and just maybe his genes and all the rest of it because many of these boxers are... are yes. Well, I did, I did, you know, I had the opportunity to, to spend some time with uh, members of the London Ex-Boxers Association were a great group of people. I was, they were so kind to me and so welcoming to me. When I, I came to, to London and um, in 2002, and one of the things that I was doing there was I actually uh, was researching and writing an opera based on the life of Jack Kidberg called The Whitechapel Whirlwind. Um, and during the course of this research, I had an opportunity to spend time with members of the London Ex-Boxers Association, attended some of their meetings, and became a member, actually, of London Ex-Boxers. They let me become a member, even though I obviously had never fought before, but just because of my association with Jack. And Jack, you know, had been vice president of the London Ex-Boxers Association, and I got a chance to meet people like Morton Lewis. Morton Lewis is a fascinating guy, was a fascinating guy. He was the son of Ted Kid Lewis the boxer with, about whom I spoke earlier. Right. And so there were a number of great champions. There was British flyweight champion um, uh, Sammy McCarthy, who was a member of the London X Boxers Association. There was, um, so there was a, a famous snooker player, like a, sort of like billiards, uh, named, I think it was Ronnie O'Sullivan. Um, and his grandfather, who had been a boxer, was uh, the president of the, or the, maybe the vice president at the time of the Ex-Boxers Association. So I got to hang out with him. Nasher Powell, whom I mentioned earlier. Right, from the, Henry V. From Henry V. Um, and, and many, many other boxers, really top-level championship boxers, including um, uh, Henry Cooper I got a chance to meet. Um, you know, just lots of really interesting people. But what unfortunately impressed me about many of them is that they were, uh, many of them seemed to be suffering from the after effects mm -hmm. of their careers as boxers, you know, having some, some issues with cognitive function or, or other physical ailments. And, you know, but some of them lived to be a pretty, pretty old age, right. you know, in their 70s and 80s and whatnot. You know, Mickey Duff I met, who was a, a boxing promoter, but had started his career as a, a fighter himself. Um, and uh, yeah, so that it's clearly the case that, that boxers do develop these kinds of issues. And I think, you know, Jack, I don't know that he actually ever That's developed some of these you. kind of cognitive issues in his later life. He seemed to be pretty with it as, from what I could tell. And I never actually met him, just to be clear. I unfortunately never got to England before he died in, in 1991. But I almost feel like I did meet him because during the course of my research, I had access to 18 hours of recorded interviews with Jack and with many people associated with him, including, for example, British gangster um, Jack Spot Comer, who led the protection rackets in the East End of London in the 1930s and was a close friend of Jack and his, especially his younger brother, Teddy. Um, but, um, you know, listening to these recordings of Jack speaking in the late 1980s, when he must have been, you know, in his late 70s, he seemed pretty with it. Right. He didn't seem to really be suffering from any ill effects. He might have, you know, perhaps... Oh, repeated himself a little bit more than than somebody a little younger, but uh, I think that that's you know most people as they get older start to have a little bit of decline. Right. Um, 
But I, he didn't strike me as anybody who was in severe decline at all. And th that's funny you said it because referring to that BBC TV show, right? mm -hmm. well, British show, This Is Your Life, he was witty in that yeah. very funny, it's still great shape, yes. like you were saying. Um, so, you know, Father Time was very good to him, and I think he was good to Father Time yeah. as well. He took good care of himself that way. And I have to ask you this. You wrote an opera. Mm -hmm. Have you ever decided to do a screenplay? Because this is rocky uh, well, you know, I mean, it, it, this, this is an a great interesting, story. There, there's a lot of great things that that his life and career could could turn into um, a screenplay or a film about him. And in fact, actually, there is a, a British sports writer named Jonathan Rendall who started to make a film about him and actually completed quite a bit of it. It was never actually released, but I did obtain um, a pre-release copy from one of the editors of the film, so I actually have it somewhere. I, it's kind of gotten lost in oh. one of my moves. Not totally lost. I'm sure it's <laughs> around somewhere. It's in a box somewhere probably still. But, but um, yeah, so there was a film made about him. Um, it was a little bit more quasi-documentary, quasi-fictionalized, um, based in part on a book by Jonathan Randall called This Bloody Mary is the Last Thing I'll Ever Own, or something like that. Um, great book, by the way, which has a lot of stuff about Jack in it. Um, but, um, yeah, so there hasn't been a film per se made, and, and I know that he was sort of trying to have things like that done in his later years, but it never came right. to fruition. Uh, for me, making a film about it is probably not the path I'm going to take. Right. Because uh, I'm not really a, a filmmaker, um, and I'm not sure that there's, you know, if there was a filmmaker who was willing to make such a film about him, I'm sure it would be, I, would, I would be happy to help, as would members of his family, but I, I'm not sure that there is anybody ready to do that, despite his interesting life. Uh, certainly there have been some boxing films made in recent years, but there, for me, writing an opera was my way of bringing his life story to the public and to make his career and life more well known. And so that's why I chose to write an opera about him because to me, the drama that mm. took place in his life, both in the ring and outside of the ring, was such powerful things that uh, they lent themselves well to the drama of the stage. Um, and boxing itself is almost like dance in many respects. The movement, you know, this potential for dance things in this, this opera, um, and, uh, of course, the character of Legs Diamond appears in the opera. Um, and Legs Diamond got his name Legs because he was known to be a great dancer. dancer. So his role <laughs> is actually of a non-singing dancer character. Um, there are also a couple of other interesting characters in the opera. It runs all in my family. Uh, one of my, uh, my uncle, my father's brothers, um, his wife was a singer and dancer with Xavier Cugat's big band in the 1950s and 60s. So she actually appears as a character, a small cameo role in the opera, um, as a non-apparatic singing role, sort of la Latina style of singing, um, you know, Afro-Cuban kind of big band singing number. And uh, there's also a, the role of another dancer in the opera, which is actually my mother-in-law, who was a dancer with the Chandra Kaley Dance Company, wow. toured all over the world, including in Havana, um, Cuba in 1951, where they were the warm-up act for the Xavier Cugat Big Band. <laughs> so, of course, there's a scene that takes place in the Tropicana nightclub in Havana during, in 1951 when Jack goes to Cuba to visit his old friend Kid Chocolate and to be seen as a celebrity figure in this nightclub and to party there. And uh, so there's a Cuban nightclub scene that takes place in the opera. So there's all this colorful you know, elements in the, the opera. I'll just tell you another couple of other little, one other little colorful story that you'll enjoy, I think. So Jack was kind of a bit of a wise guy. So the story is that um, he used to like to try to wind up these gangsters. This is back in the late 20s, early 30s, around that time. And there's a fight that he had with a guy named Jimmy McNamara. Um, so at the weigh-in, he showed up to the weigh-in after having drank a jar of pickle juice, of all things. Okay. Drank the whole jar of pickle juice, <laughs> which made him turn absolutely green and look horrible. So he shows up to the weigh-in and he's looking sick. He's looking bad. And there are all these gangsters who are you know, watching him at this weigh-in there and they think, oh, oh, Berg looks bad. He's gonna lose. Let's bet against him. Let's bet, bet on McNamara. We'll, we'll win a lot of money. So of course, after he drinks that pickle juice and has his weigh-in and looks bad, by the next day, he's perfect. perfect. He's just fine. 
And so when he gets to that fight, he beats McNamara. And these gangsters lose their shirts, and they're not too happy with him. <laughs> So the whole gangster thing from the Legs Diamond story to the gambling and McNamara fight thing kind of comes back to haunt him in 1951 at this Tropicana nightclub where while he's at this nightclub partying, all of a sudden in the middle of this dance or this, this number where uh, my aunt is singing with the Cougat band, gangsters burst in with machine guns to kill Jack. They shoot up the place with their machine guns, but they miss him and kill Kid Chocolate by mistake, who dies in Jack's arms. So there is drama. <laughs> and that's why I wanted, that's the kind of thing that you see in operas, and that's why I wanted to make it an opera. Interesting. Interesting. And of course, his best friend in the ring. That's right, right. exactly. And just, well, and I will tell you this, the viewers at home, McNamara was an actual fighter. Absolutely. He beats him. Actually, that's win number 94, just in Thank case you. you're doing the title <laughs> out of 104 or 100 and, yeah, 104th fight. That was victory number 94 yes. at that point. So you just knew incredible. that fight, absolutely. Yeah. Because you said it, boom, I'm looking right at it. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Anything else? Well, no, I just, you know. And I, I love this because I've had so much fun. Yeah, I, me too. I mean, the, you know, it's not. What I like about sports, and you, you mentioned it before, I love sports because. I love Shakespeare, but you know how every Shakespeare tragedy ends. You watch a sitcom, you know how the sitcom ends. You watch a sporting event, you don't know what the ending is every time. And I, I, I think it's the ultimate drama. It's, and boxing, really, when you think about it, is the ultimate theater because it does uh, pit man versus man, man versus the environment, man versus himself. You know, how many times does a guy want to give up and yet he pushes himself, pushes himself like Bird did. And how many times does he have to battle the environment or society, gangsters and all the rest That's of it? Right. It's the ultimate drama, right. boxing. Jack actually said, when I'm in the ring, I'm fighting for my life. And I believe it. Yeah. I would like to thank Howard for having me over. And of course, we're going to end the show with my cartoon on Jack Kid Berg, the Whitechapel Windmill. And I like to highlight the fact that he had 61 KOs in a career that spanned decades. That's right, from 1923 in 1945. That's a 22-year boxing career. career. Not too many people can do that, except for maybe some of these heavyweights like George Foreman who came back and were fighting at like 50 years old or something like that for show, for right. money. 
but not really. And they're not fighting every two weeks. That's right, exactly. This is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports. And I'm Howard Fredericks. Thank you for having me.